grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Wow, what a week we've had <laughs> between the time that I left Attica on Wednesday night and was getting ready for bed. The NBA had suspended games and I had received an email on behalf of our Synod telling us that the governor of Kentucky had asked all faith communities, no matter the size, to suspend gathering for worship. And it seems like the world went a little bit upside down. Wednesday evening, Pastor Jim and I met, made plans to meet with the council presidents to make decisions. And by Thursday afternoon, before we had even had that meeting, the health department of Warren and Fountain County asked that we not gather in groups of 10 or more. So what a week we've had. Churches all over the United States have been wondering what we should do next. Should we just take, take extra safety measures and worship anyway? Or should we not meet at all, doing our best to be God to our neighbor and limit the likelihood of unknowingly spreading this disease to individuals who are carrying the illness, from individuals who are carrying the illness and aren't showing symptoms? Do we still practice communion? the physical act of taking God into us when we aren't quite sure about the worldly elements that hold God in, with, and under. Something that I want all of you to know is that none of these decisions were made lightly or without a lot of consideration. So Facebook is a strange place right now, but I do see one thing that rang really true for me, and it was about how those of us that are called into some form of public ministry, how it is our job to look at everything that happens, every decision that is made theologically. Of course, we look at the science and the law and the ordinances of the place where we live, the physical needs of people, but we also look at these things in light of how we understand God. And so I want to share with you a few things that I've thought about, about the entire situation with COVID-19 in light of our theology. So I think it's a good time to go back to our roots and in a Lutheran church after the Bible, that means Luther's small catechism. Luther did something really great in this, is that he not only wanted people to understand or to know the commandments, he wanted you to know them, but he wanted you to know how to apply them. In the section where he asks, was ist das, or what is this, or what does this mean, we get some insights into our theological heritage. So theologically, we might be able to see two conflicting commandments going on. The first is to remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. The fifth is you shall not commit murder. So first, I'm going to do just a short catechism speech because I've learned that most, even those who have been Lutheran from the cradle were, and were, or were confirmed Lutheran, sometimes need a little bit of reminding about what, about what our catechism tells us. So the explanation to the third commandment, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy, is this. We are to fear and love God so that we do not despise preaching or God's word, but instead keep that word holy and gladly hear and learn it. Our second commandment that we'll look at, the fifth commandment, is one shall not murder. What does this mean is we are to fear and love God so that we neither endanger nor harm the lives of our neighbors but instead help and support them in all of life's needs. So when I looked at those two, I was pretty certain what we would need to do. That doesn't mean that I liked it very much though. Clinton County 
where our shared ministry experiment partners are was given no such suggestion to avoid gatherings of 10 or more. And I'll be honest, I don't really know why. I've heard rumors that test kits are in varying supply depending on the area or that different hospitals have different capacities to help those who might become ill being the reason why different regions of the US, different regions within states are asking for different, different precautions to be taken. But eventually we just need to trust that such a drastic suggestion was made in good faith by people who understand what risks are to our most vulnerable populations. But please take hope. We will find a way to stay connected through these events. While I am no expert, creating Christian community across states and even nations is something I know a little bit about because of the nature of how I got my theological training. I have colleagues living in all corners of the United States and even a few in other nations, including Nicaragua and Estonia and Hong Kong. And we made it work. We found a way to come together, supported as a community, and in the most difficult times in the last few years, I've relied on my cohort that is spread out all throughout the United States and beyond. We became Christian community across many, many miles, and we can do that here as well. So let us pray. Merciful God, <clears throat> the fountain of living water, you quench our thirst and wash away our sin. Give us this water always. Bring us to drink from the well that flows with the beauty of your truth. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our gospel lesson today is from the fourth chapter of John beginning with the first verse, excuse me, with the fifth verse. Jesus came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son, Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy some food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have no bucket and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob who gave us the well and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will become in them, in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty. <coughs> or I have to come here to draw water. Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come back. Jesus answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you are right in saying, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me. The hour is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. 
we worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming, and now here, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeks such as these to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. Just then, his disciples came. They were astonished that he was speaking with a woman, but no one said, what do you want? Or why are you speaking with her? The woman left her water jar and went back to the city. She said to the people, come and see a man who told me everything I have ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? They left the city and were on their way to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, rabbis, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, surely no one has brought him something to eat. Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to complete his work. Do you not say four months more and then comes the harvest? But I tell you, look around you and see how the fields are ripe for harvesting. The reaper is already receiving wages and gathering fruits of eternal life so that the sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. Many Samaritans came from that city and came to believe in him. Because of the woman's testimony, he told me everything I have ever done. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, it is no longer because what you have said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that it is truly the savior of the world. The word of the Lord, thanks be to God. Give me a drink. The request from Jesus here is simple and straightforward. At the same time, his simple and straightforward request leads to a conversation that opens the hearts and minds of an entire people as they come to understand Jesus as the savior of the world. Give me a drink. This is one of the most human things that could ever be said such a human moment and such a human need. Give me a drink. Jesus makes himself the vulnerable one as he asks a Samaritan. She is the one with means to water and he without. She is the one with the type of power at that moment and he is without. Just as he always seems to do, Jesus manages to turn social order on its head. A Jewish man asking a Samaritan woman for a favor. And by turning that social order on its head, he starts a conversation. It's helpful to consider this passage in light of the, the past, similar passage from last week, where Jesus speaks with the Pharisee Nicodemus. The wise and learned man Nicodemus struggles to accept the message that Jesus brings. Nicodemus has a lot to lose being seen with Jesus. But in the end, he sees Jesus, really sees who Jesus is. 
The Samaritan woman, on the other hand, risks nothing being seen with Jesus. It is likely that Jesus would have something to lose being seen with her. Jesus and the Samaritan woman at the well meet in the middle of the day when the light is brightest and Jesus doesn't shy away. Jesus reaches out to her. But why? Why does Jesus choose a woman who has apparently been disgraced in her own community to bring the message of the village to the village of Sychar? Our text tells us that Jesus had to go through Samaria. And that is true a little bit. The most direct route, as the crow flies, as my family would say, would have been through Samaria, but far more common path for a Jew would be to cross over the Jordan, walk through Gentile lands, and then cross back. That is how distasteful the Jews and the Samaritans were to each other. But Jesus had to travel to Samaria for another reason. And we learned about that last week too, because God loves the world. Last week, our scripture lesson told us that God loves the world. Not that God loves the Jews or that God loves the Gentiles. God loves the world, including Samaria. So Jesus had to go to Samaria because God loves the Samaritans. Another beautiful part of this passage is that woman at the well, she abandons her work and goes back to her village to tell others about Jesus. Gathering water has been women's work across cultures and across ages, and she abandons this. And she runs to tell the people of Samaria. She has a bigger purpose. As a woman in the pulpit, when many claim that a woman shouldn't do this work, I find some strength and hope in that. When Christ comes to us, we are all called to proclaim who Jesus is. This is a person who has very little standing in the ancient world. She's female. Jesus said that she has had five husbands. And while this has been painted as an idea that she had questionable morals, it is highly more likely that she was really a woman that was unable to have a child. And she had been put aside again and again and again for that reason. With all these things, the woman is clearly one of the lowest in society, but here she is declaring the reality that Jesus is this very, very special person. She brings people to Christ she brings them to their savior, the savior of the world. When we look at our communities, we always see those who are somehow on the margins of society, who are addicted or ill or live in deep poverty. Every town or city, no matter the size or demographics, has at least a few of these. What are we doing to engage those people in conversation? How are we inviting them to come and, make, and meet Jesus? So I haven't been at First Lutheran Church for very long. But one thing I do know is that every month you choose a charity to work with and that you do what you can in order to help. I did a little bit of reading about Hope Springs today to learn about what you do there. And I see a message of the Samaritan woman all over it. In ancient Jewish culture, a woman who couldn't carry a child could be divorced for no other reason. 
And being divorced in the ancient world was not something that a woman could recover from very well. She had to be granted a certificate of divorce, but after that, where was she to go? Sometimes a male family member would be able to take her into the household, but this was often a burden on resources and he would want her to be married off again as soon as possible. And that sounds pretty abusive, pretty much like domestic abuse. She was treated as if she didn't have any value. Hope Springs offers a place for those who are experiencing something similar. Acts of violence are basically acts that show that the perpetrator doesn't believe the other person has value. When you give to Hope Springs or almost any reputable charity or cause, you give something that says you do have value to those who have been told that they don't. Jesus speaking to a Samaritan and a woman indicates that all human beings have value. As Christ moved through the world, loving all, it is our task to do our best to follow his example. We do this not out of obligation, but out of gratitude for what we have been given on the cross. First Lutheran Church is being Christ to Hope Springs. And that is something to be grateful for. Even amidst the uncertainty and, certainty and confusion of these last days, we will be Christ. We will be loving to one another. And we will be loving to the world. Amen.